Hello and welcome to a special feature from Warhammer40kbookreviews.com Today I'm gonna be doing something a little unusual. As uh, someone who reviews books, it's quite common for me to read a book that I don't really care much for. And in that case I'll write a critical review and I'll move on to the next book. But every once in a while, there's a book that just annoys me so much that I can't stop thinking about how much it's annoying me and how much that it's really, really getting to me that the way it has been written or the way that characters in the book has acted. The Unremembered Empire, one of uh, the books in the Horus Heresy series, is a special case like that where there are just so many things in that book that really really grind my gears. I've put together a list of five that are just the worst ones in the book and that really made me incredibly frustrated reading through uh, this one. The first one is how Rebuti Gulliman is portrayed in uh, The Unremembered Empire. Now, if you've read some of the Horus Heresy books, you've seen plenty of accounts of uh, Primarchs and uh, how they are incredibly strong and powerful. The Primarchs are, of course, the genetic sons of the Emperor himself. And while they're not quite the demigod that the Emperor is, they're much stronger than any space marine, much quicker, much smarter, and uh, some of them have uh, psycho powers even to make them even more powerful. So, uh, therefore, I was very surprised when in uh, the Unremembered Empire there is a scene where Rebuta Gulliman is uh, attacked inside his own office by 10 space marines from the Alpha Legion. Gulliman is uh, not aware of uh, this attack until just before it happens. The Alpha Legions have actually uh, concealed themselves as uh, ultramarines, but Gulliman uh, knows that something is off and just a few seconds before they make their move, he actually uh, discovers that uh, they're, they're, that something is not right here and, and someone is, uh, is trying to uh, attack me actually. And I would have expected that this would mean that basically, basically Gulliman will just slaughter all these marines and be annoyed and confused how did they manage to get into my inner sanctum. But what actually happens is a intense life and death fight where Rebuta Gulliman is uh, wearing his full armor, minus his helmet, but uh, otherwise is fully armored but is almost killed by just 10 normal space marines from the Alpha Legion. And in fact, the only reason that he survives the attack at all is because the last uh, Alpha Legion Legionnaire has Gulliman uh, down, but uh, then he takes too long stance and gloats over him before uh, taking his shot, and that allows Gulliman to kill him. And that just seems really strange and really bad that, that a Primarch would be all of a sudden so much um, weaker than how they have been portrayed in all the other Horus Heresy books and that really just threw me off and, and really got to me and it also got to me in this particular scene how an Alpha Legion Space Marine apparently uh, all of a sudden has changed from being very efficient and uh, completely without ego soldiers that carry out their mission and don't stand and waste time gloating uh, when their prey is down there. He should have just finished his uh, mission, killed Goodyman and been out of there. It, it's not very Alpha Legion-like uh, for a Marine to to um, yeah stand around gloating like that. Number two is about uh, another Primarch, Conrad Kurze, who is the Primarch of the Night Haunters, uh, one of the Trader Space Marine Legions. And he is apparently super powerful, incredibly powerful, especially compared to uh, Rebuta Gulliman 
and also compared to uh, Lionel Johnson, the Primarch of the Dark Angels, who's also in this book. So while Robuto Gulliman can hardly kill 10 Space Marines, the Night Haunter, Conrad Kurzer, is able to take on uh, fully armed squads of Space Marines at a time. And in one section, it even seems that he has been able to flip off a land raider on its side uh, with his own hands. And a land raider is like uh, 72 tons of armor and heavy weapons. So this is very confusing. Are the Primarchs super superhumans or are they just slightly better than uh, the normal Space Marines? And it gets even worse when later in the book, uh, Kurtzer faces off against uh, Robuto Gullman and the Lion in uh, one-on-one combat. And he actually fights both of them at once, which is just very strange because uh, the Lion is uh, probably one of the best hand-to-hand fighters of all the Primarchs. He has fought uh, Lehman Ross and uh, basically fought to a to a standstill in one-on-one battle and Lehman Ross is probably maybe the single most uh, powerful or skilled uh, melee combatant otherwise in the in all of the Primarchs so suddenly uh, Conrad Kurze who is much more of a sort of a hit, hit and run guy and relies on terror and not really direct confrontation suddenly he is able to take on uh, two Primarchs just uh, striding in and and fighting them uh, off alone, which is a ridiculous notion. Number three, continuing on with the Primarchs, because it's another issue with this book, it's just too many Primarchs, but uh, that, that's not the point here. Number three is the Primarch Vulcan, uh, who is the Primarch of the Salamander Space Marines. In... Uh, one of the previous Horus Heresy books, uh, which is called Vulcan Lives, which I have also reviewed and which is also a quite boring book, but not quite as bad as The Unremembered Empire, at least. Uh, but in this book, Vulcan Lives, we uh, hear the tale of how Vulcan is captured by uh, Conrad Kurze, and he's uh, tortured and you can say he's killed, but uh, Vulcan cannot die each time he is killed. He just... Uh, comes back he his body reincarnates but uh, anyway he is tortured and and uh, destroyed let's call it that many times by Conrad Kurze in an attempt for Kurze to break his spirit and uh, corrupt him and and fall to chaos this uh, eventually ends with uh, Vulcan almost falling to chaos he's almost completely broken but at the in the end of the book, he manages to overcome his uh, his weakness. He manages to to fight against uh, these uh, this torture by Kurze, and he actually outsmarts Kurze, uh, and then he manages to escape and teleport to um, um, to, to the Ultramarines uh, capital world. Now the whole point of Vulcan lives like the whole point the the idea the what what you kind of gain from reading this book is to see that Vulcan is extremely tough that he is not broken that he is he is able to fight off chaos he's able to fight off this incredible uh, brutal torture so I was very surprised when he shows up in the unremembered empire and apparently has just lost all his marbles he shows up and he is just crazy and has been driven mad and there's really no explanation for how he got from being able to fight off the torture and how he found his inner strength to all of a sudden being completely crazy after all that just seems very strange and basically negates the whole point of Vulcan lives number four is the fact that uh, Gulliman activates an ancient Xenos machine that uh, has he has very little understanding about, but he knows that it's very powerful. 
This is a machine that uh, he uses as a beacon in the in the warp storms that uh, are um, are raging about the uh, the ultramarine planets, and he activates this old Xenos machine, and it is uh, it works as a beacon for ships lost in the warp storm, so they can uh, travel to the ultramarine uh, home planet. And he doesn't really know exactly who built the machine. He doesn't really know exactly what it does. This is clearly stated in the book. This is not just conjecture. But uh, he only hesitates a brief moment before he uh, orders that the machine should be turned on. Um, and of course, yeah, he wants to turn it off on so uh, so other Imperial um, ships can, can come to the Ultramarine homeworld. But this seems very strange in a age. Well, this is still the cage, but uh, but the the Imperium really hates Xenos technology. The Great Crusade, even at at the time, even before the the 40k timeline where the Empire has gotten even more xenophobic, even back uh, in the 31st millennium, the Imperium was extremely xenophobic. And Xenos technology was not something that you just used, and especially something that is obviously powerful that you don't really know the purpose of. That so it seems very strange. Someone uh, as smart as Gulliman and someone who is so loyal to the Emperor would go out of his way to still use this kind of uh, technology. The final point, number five, that uh, relates to uh, space wolves. The space wolves show up at some point in the story and they come and visit uh, Gulliman. They are sent by the Emperor because the Emperor, or at least uh, forces on Terra, are worried about if uh, Gulliman is going to uh, turn like uh, so many of the other legions have. Therefore, the Space Wolves are sent to watch over Gulliman and see that he doesn't uh, do anything illoyal to, towards the Imperium and he follows all the rules set down by the Emperor. One of the first things that the Space Wolves find out when they arrive is that uh, Rubusu Gulliman is uh, still using librarians, which is completely outlawed by the Emperor after the Council of Nikea. And uh, they also quickly find out that uh, Gulliman is uh, contemplating uh, announcing his Ultramarines empire as uh, a secondary Imperium because uh, he is worried that if the if Terra falls then the, the Imperium will need a new capital or he will need a new imperium basically to take the place of, of the emperor and that is of course also an extremely dangerous thought which the space wolves are naturally very concerned about actually uh, proclaiming a new imperium now we've seen before how space wolves react when they uh, find someone who is going against the wishes of the Emperor. In uh, one of the other Horus Heresy books, we have a, here a story about Space Wolves that are stationed on uh, Lionel Johnson's flagship when uh, it, it uh, gets attacked by demons from the warp. And the demons are killing everyone in the ship. They are just slaughtering everything in their path. And the lion discovers that, well, the librarians, they're actually able to stop the demons. They're actually able to hurt them and kill them. But obviously, you're not allowed to use the librarians because of the Council of Nikea, which outlawed uh, the use of Saigas in the Space Marine Legions. And the Space Wolves refuse to let the lion use these uh, librarians. And in fact, this is only resolved when the lion straight up kills the space wolves that are stationed on his ship, he has to slaughter them because they refuse to allow the lion to use the librarians because the librarians are not allowed 
to be used by decree of the emperor. So here they find that Gulliman is using librarians and they don't do anything about it. They basically say, mm, that seems a bit dangerous. And then Gulliman says, oh, uh, not so much. And they're like, oh, I guess you're right then. And that is just very uncharacteristic of Space Wolves. And there really is no reason why they would not re react stronger to this. So as you probably gathered by now, I think there are a lot of reasons why the Unremembered Empire is not only a poorly written book, but a book that has a lot of issues if you are a Warhammer 40k lore fan, and even a lot of issues just if you have read some of the other Horus Heresy books. Anyway, that is uh, me done ranting for now. I hope you will join me for more book reviews here on warhammer40kbookreviews.com.